Bitcoin's never going to go away. This, this, crypto is software. There's nothing nefarious about software. Software didn't do anything wrong. It's the people that were abusing it, misusing it, and frauding with it. And the bad actors, they're going to be gone. I mean, I agree with making them illegal, but not the actual technology, which is very advanced. I'll give you a use case that I think you'd appreciate. This just happened to me this week. So, you know, I'm a big watch collector, and there's a new hot uh, watchmaker that just emerged in Switzerland named Simon Briel. He is smoking hot. He made 12 production watches and then five special prototypes. He's the next FP Journe. Now, the ability to get one of these pieces, to get one of those five, he's only going to sell number three and four. You have to be accepted as a collector. He has to know with certainty that you're going to honor his brand. He's like Picasso. Wow. Came out, he was a watchmaker, an apprentice watchmaker, and then he started showing, showing some tendencies towards tremendous style. Unbelievable dials, incredible, never seen before pieces of art. Stunning, stunning. All kinds of innovations that no one's ever seen. Like the gears are, are made of shark teeth, or they look like little shark teeth working together. Of course, that fits for me, being a shark and all that. But also, yeah, yeah. incredible polishing techniques and this new modeling with gold on the dial, which is unbelievable. The point is, to get that piece, you have to be accepted, and there's only two for sale. The first one went to a minister in the United Arab Emirates, who's a friend of mine. So he went on my behalf to Simon and introduced me. We did a long one hour Zoom. I talked, my, I, I gave my case. I won that, that number four. So number three and four, I have number four. Now I have to pay him. Now I have to transfer the capital, which is material. Now get this, the SWIFT system, I take US dollars. I got to transfer right. it to a bank in Zurich. Three days. Right. They got my money for three days. They're not paying me any interest. Then I got to transfer the USD into Swiss francs. I get clipped 20 basis points there, and then I got to pay Simon. I'm getting totally screwed. Now, if I had- yeah, but you don't a, care. Well, I, <laughs> I care because I realize if I could just use a, a digital payment system like USDC or any other one that was regulated, right. I could right. send it to him in one second. And so right, right. that's why this innovation is going to happen. And I'm just one use case, you know, but the point is these senators, yeah. these governors, now, Toomey has retired. We knew he was carrying the digital football until yep. Jan 3rd. Now we have Haggerty's team. He's picking up the baton, and I think he's going to become the go-to senator, kind of hockey sticking through this, through the House. So I'm hoping that we'll get some policy in the next 9, 12 months. We'll see. Welcome back at Market Empire, your partner giving you your daily dose about the latest crypto news and thoughts of different analysts and investors. Watch it till the end of the video. Kevin O'Leary, star of the television show Shark Tank, has gotten himself into a bit of trouble this week after posting a bizarre tweet in which he suggests that people should give up literally everything in order to achieve financial freedom. It's possible that your wife will leave you, your dog will die, and your mother will become hostile toward you. There is no relevance in any of these things. What really matters is that you are successful and that you break free of your limitations. After that, you are free to act in any manner you see fit. Because of this tweet, O'Leary received a significant amount of backlash on Twitter as well as from the media. And in my opinion, the criticism was warranted. Kevin O'Leary's public reputation has been in a downward spiral ever since the FTX fiasco, and his tweets aren't doing anything to reverse the trend. Nevertheless, O'Leary explains why he is extremely bullish on Bitcoin, crypto, and alternative asset classes for 2023 in his most recent interview. Be sure to watch the entire video until the very end. We are at 38% cash, yielding about 3.2 to 3.8%, depending on duration. Uh, that's a, a pretty high amount for us right now. We also put on uh, a 4% uh, Bitcoin position uh, starting in the mid-November uh, after the FTX debacle, we had to re-establish some positions. But obviously, we put them up in Canada under the OSC jurisdiction, which is a completely compliant platform called BitBuy. That's where I hold it. And uh, that is one of my best performing assets. We were buying at just sub-17,000. Here we are at 23. It's been a great performer. Um, you know, everybody has their own opinion about Bit, uh, of any of the cryptos, actually. But um, I think now is a time to be very careful with, with crypto because right. you, 
you know, Bitcoin, you don't have to have 32 positions. You can have six and you get the same volatility. On equities, I'm a little more cautious. I won't buy anything now that doesn't have positive cash flow on all 11 sectors with distributions. I'm hoping to get 6% capital appreciation by year end on the equity, plus 2% yield of some kind. Bonds were terrible last year. We're tiptoeing into short duration, triple B and above a little bit. I, th I think you got to keep your powder dry. I'm kind of in that Ray camp. 38% mm -hmm. cash is a lot of cash. The big decision I'm trying to make today is how much of this chat, you know, AI do I want to buy? Um, it's a smoking hot deal. The valuation's crazy, but I think I have to participate. Well, Ferrari has become a luxury brand in itself. Even if you don't buy the car, you can buy the merchandise. It's smoking hot as well. I, I mean, all these categories. Let me give you some categories that that have really kept pace with Ferrari. Vintage cars, not cars that are less than 10 years old, but the vintage Ferraris have outpaced the S&P dramatically. Vintage watches uh, have outpaced. Vintage writing instruments, pens, modern art. I mean. There is a desire to deploy alternative asset classes in this cycle like never before. And so when I make watch purchases like what I'm doing right now on the Simon Briel piece, that's really an alternative asset class. I mean, it's, it's sort of, I'm thinking I'll make 11 to 17% a year on that in the next 20 years, like I did with my FP Journe. So Ferrari falls into that category. You're seeing the same thing with Tiffany, Patek Philippe, Adamar Piquet. All of these brands have survived the, the you know, mm -hmm. volatility of 2022 and are coming into 2023 very strong because there's a lot of cash, $4 trillion cash on the sidelines looking for a place to be deployed. Now, Rolex market I'm very familiar with. Primary Rolex, no, you can't. Secondary markets down 28% if the watch is less than three years old. When you get past three years, it's been a very stable market. Vintage, they have a new program, Danielle, that they're trying to launch um, in March, where if you bring your old piece in, they'll re-authenticate it with a new certificate. I think they're going to have a hard time with that because they require you to give up your original certificate, which I would never do. And so Rolex is going through this remarkable transition because they realize their secondary market is far more valuable than their primary. It's 12 times the size, and they want to somehow figure out how to participate in that. So a lot of these brands, so they've, you know, Rolex is contacting me about this. I've got a massive Rolex collection. And I said, guys, I'm never giving up my primary certificate ever. <laughs> I think it's going to be very interesting this year. My anticipation for terms of what we'll get in returns are going to be around 6% from equity. And I'm talking the whole year. And another 2% yeah. from div yield or distribution. So an 8% year, which is kind of right in the middle of what you anticipate. What I've learned is, Consumers still have fat wallets. They still have a lot of cash sitting around. They were prudent in terms of all the freebies they were given out. Um, when we talk to new recruits in their early 30s, people that have already had one job now moving, they have a lot of demands. 40% of them won't work in an office, particularly in infrastructure work or in accounting or payroll or logistics or compliance, those departments. I'm just interviewing a third round for, for more financial analysts. I found two great ones to add to Allure Ventures. We need them for this North Dakota initiative. Not a chance they're coming into the office. And these guys are, and this one woman, one guy, <laughs> they, I, yeah. you know, they, they, they've never worked in an office. They don't even know what that means. And so there's a whole new tonality to the workforce that I don't think right. everybody's adjusted to yet. Thanks for watching. What do you think of Kevin O'Leary's newest Bitcoin and Ethereum forecast? Do agree with him or not? Leave your comments down below and see you on to the next one.